Thank you. Okay, Chair. Right. Uh, I think everybody's got their cameras off besides one. Um, right. Good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock. Welcome to our planning committee. I myself, I'll introduce myself, our county councillor Ruth Edwards, and I now chair the planning committee. Welcome to the public, general public, and very often because we're live streaming, the members and our council officers. So everyone is welcome to this uh, meeting because it is held fully remotely. This meeting is held in accordance with emergency legislation that enables the council to hold this meeting remotely alongside the council's constitution and ensures that the council can continue to operate and make democratic decisions in an open and trust transparent way. I would like to remind members that this meeting is still being live streamed to the public and can I request that you all switch off your cameras and mute your microphones when you are not speaking directly to the committee to ensure there is no unnecessary background noise. All sections of the Members Code of Conduct will apply to members in this virtual meeting environment and are as applicable now as they are in a traditional meeting setting. Can I also remind members of the meeting to ensure their chat functionality is switched on and should they wish to speak on a particular application to make their request clear in that area and I will invite you to speak at the relevant point in the meeting where you would then unmute your microphone and switch your camera back on. Until you're invited in, please do not interrupt. Decisions on this remote committee will hold the same weight as a decision of a normal planning committee, provided that the meeting remains quiet and meets its legislative requirements to make a decision, regardless of whether a member of this meeting is unable to cast a vote due to technical issues, the decision of the committee will still remain valid. And um, Nicola, do you have um, apologies for absence, please? Uh, no apologies received, Chair. Oh, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Welcome on board. Thank you for the uh, postage of the agenda for myself and Councillor Clark. De decisions, um, declarations of interest, please. Any members got declarations? None whatsoever, as and when. Uh, could anybody like uh, to move the minutes of the last committee meeting, uh, unless there are issues of accuracy that need to be recorded again, please? I move, who's who's moving that? Jim Councillor. Sorry. Jim Higginson was one. Has right. Moved. Right. They've I'll both. second it. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So that will be noted and I will sign the minutes later. Um, right. We now go on to the applications for today. And the first one is in Abergavenny. Application DC stroke 2010 stroke 00670. Uh, Amy, are you taking that one? Or is it Phil? I am, though, that'll be me. Thank you very right. much. Could you introduce your yourself, please, Amy, for those that are viewing? Of course, thank you very much. Um, my name's Amy Longford. I'm the Heritage and Applications um, Area Team Manager. So uh, the application here, the first one this afternoon is DC 2010-00670. It's for the car park to the rear of 34 to 39 Cross Street, Abergavenny, for the residential development of eight units, comprising of a one bed flat, a two bed flat above the carport and six three bedroom houses and all associated works. So the application was presented to this committee on the 6th of October, 2015 where the proposal was recommended for approval subject to the relevant conditions and the signing of a Section 106 agreement. The Section 106 agreement has not been signed and in the interim period, further advice in relation to two specific areas of policy, specifically flooding and drainage, have changed, meaning that the development is no longer in accordance with these policies. For clarity, however, I shall take this committee through the scheme quickly as proposed and then explain the areas of policy change and their implications. So the application as you can see on the site plan in front of you, is located within the centre of Abergavenny to the rear of 34 to 39 Cross Street, also known as Gunter Mansions. The site is currently a private car park and service yard with ad hoc parking for the tenants of the retail premises of Gunter Mansions. It's also located within the Abergavenny development boundary 
the central shopping area, the Abergavenny conservation area, archaeologically sensitive area, a C2 flood zone and adjacent to the grade two star listed building of Gunter Mansions. The principle of residential development is considered in line with the local development plan policies, specifically S1 and H1 of the LDP and subject to the normal material considerations. If we could just move to the next slide, please, it shows us the site plan and the layout of the proposed developments with units one to seven fronting onto Bailey Priory. These consist of six three bedroom houses arranged over three floors connecting with a connecting first floor flat, unit three, over the vehicular entrance to the site. A further one bedroom flat over the garage to the rear is proposed and that is unit eight, as you can see on the plan. 14 car parking spaces together with eight visitor spaces are provided on site. So as the application was considered in 2015 by the planning committee, the main considerations of the application were deemed acceptable and approved in principle subject to the relevant conditions controlling archaeology, materials and removing certain PD rights. Concerns were raised by the highways officer in relation to traffic and traffic movements from Bailey Priory. However, it was considered that the parking arrangements at present could accommodate an unlimited number of cars and the formalisation of this presented was a benefit. In addition, the central and sustainable location allowed for a relaxation of parking provision on site. So the next slide will show us some site sections. The dwellings fronting onto Bailey Priory were initially <coughs> to be quite tall. However, these were reduced in height to accommodate concerns of officers. Whilst they are still somewhat taller than the buildings fronting Cross Street, the distance between them is considered sufficient for the gap um, to be visually acceptable. So the following slide will show the floor plan of the proposed units. It shows the three bed units with bedrooms on the first floor and attic floor, and the central section is accommodating the fact over the vehicular entrance at first floor level. So the next slide shows you the elevations of the development as proposed, units one to seven. They're quite simple vernacular townhouses set in a terrace appearing to climb the hill in line with the topography. The design and materials chosen was considered at length and significant amendments made to the plans to propose a simple design and a palette of materials that are found elsewhere in the town. The proposals were therefore considered to be acceptable in the conservation area and within the setting of the listed building. So the next slide will show us the unit eight, which is the flat above the carport. This is located closer to the rear of Gunter Mansions and incorporates a two bed flat with parking to the rear underneath. So the photographs we can do to those next show us the site as it appeared in 2015. However, there's been very little change since. The stone building at the rear of the site is the listed building with a modern single story flat roof extension. The taller building, as you can see on the top right hand side, is the former Swan Hotel. And then the further photographs at the bottom will show you the car park and some existing boundary treatments to the site. The next slide shows us again the rear of uh, Gunter Mansions with the single story extension, some ad hoc parking. Uh, the stone boundary wall to the bottom of the site where it's adjacent to the public car park and the connection of Gunter Mansions um, with the uh, Swan Hotel. So the next slide now shows us the access looking north and south up Bailey Priory. Again, photos of the adjacent properties of the Swan Hotel and the rear of number 40 Cross Street there in, in White Renda. The last slide shows us the views looking into the site from the public car park. So if we just go to the next slide. Thank you. So as stated, this committee has already considered the application and recommended approval subject to the 106. However, the policy basis has changed since that consideration, meaning that the application before you today now comes with a recommendation for refusal. This is on the basis of two grounds. Firstly, in relation to the flooding and secondly, in relation to phosphates. So firstly, at the point of consideration in 2015, it was known that the site would flood to 380 millimetres in both the 1 in 100 and 1 in 1000 flood events. The residential properties would be flood free, being raised above this level. However, the shared access and car park would, be a would flood to approximately 300 millimetres. 
At this point, guidance provided some degree of tolerable levels of flooding if developments could be de demonstrated to meet the tests in TAN 15, which considered the merit of social economic benefits. However, two significant appeals in relation to the applications for highly vulnerable or residential development as this is within flood, known, within flood zones, notably Hadnock Road and the development and restoration of Troy House, have both been called in by Welsh Government and both received, refused on this policy ground. The report refers to a letter from the Welsh Government to the Chief Planning Officers relating to this very issue. The report states that the letter was received after the consideration of the application in 2015. However, it was received prior to the October committee meeting. Despite this, though, the guidance in the Chief Planning Officer letter is clear, with a clear steer from two substantial appeals, provides a clear direction in the determination of applications involving highly vulnerable development in C2 flood zones, that it is unacceptable. Therefore, the development, as proposed, is no longer considered compliant with this policy and is in conflict with the current guidance. Secondly, I'm sure all members are aware of the issues around phosphates. This relates to the change in policy surrounding water discharge. So the site here is located within Abergavenny, which is within the phosphate sensitive catchment area for the River Us. The development, as shown, is proposed to direct discharge directly into the main sewer being in the town centre of Abergavenny. As the use of the site is a car park and the proposed is for eight residential units, the increase in water discharge from the site is substantial. Therefore, the potential for the harm to the um, sack from the increased level of phosphates is unacceptable and as proposed would not comply with policy. There may be alternative means of phosphate stripping that could be incorporated in the proposals. However, these have not been explored at present as the scheme discharges into the main sewer, which connects the land foist waste treatment plant, which does not have phosphate tri stripping technology. The potential to harm is too great and therefore the development is unacceptable. In addition to the officer's report, the section 106 has not been signed. So the lack of provision of a commitment to affordable housing is also considered to be a reason for refusal. As I say, this is not identified within the officer's report. However, it is requested that committee consider this as an additional reason for refusal. The previous report identified on-site provision of one two-bed low-cost ownership house together with a financial contribution of £37,000. So the combination of these two substantial and fundamental issues on the site mean that the application is no longer considered to be policy compliant as per the officer recommendation and reasons is presented to you today for refusal together with the lack of affordable housing contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Amy. Very detailed report there, and I'm sure a lot of members would take all that on board. I'm not sure whose ward this is. Um, I don't believe it's Councillor Woodhouse. Anybody can enlighten me on whose ward that is? Tudor Thomas, I believe. Thomas. Uh, right, I don't it believe. It is Tudor Thomas. Um, I haven't had no correspondence or <coughs> any uh, comment from um, Councillor Thomas. So, uh, anybody else now wish to comment, please? Oh, well, I, can't, I, I can't find my hand, Chair, but I noticed in the local member. Uh, I think the first one wishes to comment is Councillor Harris, please. Yeah, I got on, mate. See you, there's no got it. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, I can't find my uh, my hand either. I think it's uh, so. I think it's sad that um, uh, this development was all up and ready to go, and and the developers, if you like, fouled on his own doorstep by not signing the uh, Section 106 agreement. And now things have changed, and uh, we're in a situation now where we have. Basically, as as the officer has said, no alternative but to uh, refuse the application. Um, mm. And uh, as such, uh, I'm happy to uh, move refusal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Harris. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Maureen Powell, please. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, being the next up the road from uh, from here, just the other side of Hollywell. Well, Hollowell Road's a beginning of mine, so I have got a little bit of interest in it. I mean, there are so many things against it, but what I was, the thing that was troubling me most wasn't the actual development, but was the access into the Bailey Priory Lane to get to the properties. 
if you've ever driven in Argoveni, you realise how bad it is where that little lane comes out onto Cross onto Monk Street. Um, and uh, it, it's not not the best of things. You've got three property, three, I think three properties down there already, and they have quite problems getting out from there and getting back in. If you added all these to it, um, you'd have more of a problem apart from all the other reasons. And the only way you could do it, cover that, would be to have the exit down into the bus station. I don't think that's ever been entertained. But we have enough reasons in front of us, I think, to refuse it. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Sorry if you're missing me. I jumped uh, a little bit to Councillor yeah. Powell when I should have taken Councillor Phil Murphy, Murphy beforehand. Councillor Murphy, next, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, um, Roger said pretty well what I was going to say. So uh, he's um, he's recommended re refusal. I'm quite happy to second that. All right. Ca thank you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, Councillor Eason, I believe, is next. Yes, just one quick, quick, just one quick question, Chair. I noticed when you talked about the local member representation, the report actually says comes the Prosser. So, how old is this actual report? Is it a cut and pasted report, or is it really up to date? That, that was when it originally, I believe, came to committee, yeah. uh, and of course, Councillor Prosser was a, a county yeah. councillor at that time, but he is no longer a councillor. So, it is a pretty up to date uh, presentation and report that Amy's given us today. Okay. That was just to help you reflect on when it came before us before. Yeah, that's, I noticed that. So, yes, I can understand that. They haven't signed the 106 agreement to start with, which puts a, a damper on things. And yes, uh, it, it must be turned down. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you, Councillor Eason. Councillor Sheila Woodhouse, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, the comments I wanted to raise have already been raised, especially with regard to the access onto the Hereford Road. Um, I, there was a reference in the report to um, the highways. Um, um, recommending a, a safety order there but however th there are other reasons for refusal so it's it's unfortunate because it would be a nice little site um mm -hmm. be nice to see some tasteful developments there in the curtilage of a listed building but unfortunately the reasons that have been stated by our officers uh, just we, we simply can't um, agree to this at this stage Thank no you. not at this stage we don't know what might become before us in the future because obviously it is a site there in Abergavenny. Thank yeah. you Councillor Woodhouse. Councillor Brown please. Yes thank you Chair. It seems as if on the basis of the report there's two reasons, uh, main reasons for refusal which is the flood, flood zone C2 um, area that it's in and also the um, new situation with regard to um, phosphates and pollution. But I was interested to hear when the officer um, said that there isn't um, phosphate stripping technology. So I was interested to hear, um, you know, where that is available and, and how that actually works, because obviously this is going to be a continuous issue for planning applications in this particular area. It was just a question on, on that particular thing. Thank you. Right, thank you, Councillor Brown. I don't know if Amy or Craig <coughs> or any officer wishes to update anybody, especially those viewing anything about our concerns with phosphates, which are very paramount, especially in North Monmouthshire at the moment. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Brown for uh, raising this issue, yes, it is an ongoing issue with regards to the water quality in our rivers, in both the River Y and um, the Esk River. Um, unfortunately, we don't have phosphate cap uh, stripping capability at the moment in Abergavenny, Lamphoist or within the town of Monmouth. Um, there are ongoing discussions with regards to upgrading these systems, but as it stands at the moment, the only place in the north of the county where we do have phosphate stripping capability is Raglan. Um, so yes, each application, there's some applications which will have private treatment systems, so you will notice that some applications are deemed to be acceptable in accordance with Natural Resources Wales <coughs> guidance. Um, but if we are connecting to the mains, then we do have to consider whether it does have an impact on the river. So each application needs to be considered on their own merits and it needs to go through that process with Natural Resources Wales. Um, but at the moment, the drainage system doesn't have phosphate stripping capability. So it is something that we need to be wary of and when we're making decisions and, and have to follow that Natural Resources Wales guidance. So watch this space, I suppose, in terms of how we move forward with those discussions with Walsh Wards and upgrading their system. But it, the current situation is it doesn't have phosphate stripping capability. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, because it doesn't mean all applications are denied 
it's just specific ones that come before us. Yes, some some some, some um, applications in Abergavenny land voice and in any area within the catchments will have drainage solutions which are acceptable to natural resources yes. Wales. Um, but if we're connecting to the mains, that's where potentially there could be a problem with development proposals. Right. Thank you for that explanation, Craig. Uh, Councillor Paul Jordan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a derelict site. We have a desperate need for affordable housing. I think uh, subject to uh, the developer at some stage in the future signing Section 106 and um, there'd be attenuation of phosphates over at the land forest sewage site, I, I, I can foresee at some stage in the future this will become a uh, site which would be acceptable, but certainly under the present circumstances, I think we have to refuse it. Thank yes, you. like I said, Councillor Jordan, look to the future and lots of things can happen very quickly because everybody has got this problem in Wales with the phosphates. Well, in a lot of areas. Right, thank you. Um, so I don't know if anybody else wishes to comment at all now, and I think it has been moved and seconded. I believe it was moved by Councillor Roger Harris, was it? Yeah. And seconded by yes, Madam Chair. Yeah. And, and, and I believe Councillor Murphy then seconded. So could I please go to the vote and uh, we'll then decide if you've got your hands ready in the chat bar. Um, so we've had 11 responses so far, Madam Chair, 10 are for refusal, one is against refusal. Um, as such, even though not everyone's voted yet, it, it's quite clearly for refusal, so I'm quite happy to say that that's been refused. Thank you, Dan. So you better introduce yourself to people that's viewing. <laughs> so, you so, are. Sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Denzel. I'm the uh, solicitor for the planning committee. Right. Thank you very much for that, Denzel, because some people don't follow us every week and new, new viewers would wonder who you were. You're not a county councillor. Thank you very much for that. So that is carried. Thank you, all members. We now go on to the next application, which is on your agenda. The next two, actually, but they've both been withdrawn. And uh, if anybody would need to question uh, the decision for that, I'm sure Craig is going to be very affluent and, affluent and tell you exactly the reasons why. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, there was a number of concerns raised by um, Gwent Wildlife Trust coming as late correspondents. I think it is prudent as officers to review those comments um, in line, um, in, in accordance with, um, with, in collaboration with biodiversity colleagues and also ensuring that we've covered everything off. So I think the best thing to do is to um, potentially arrange a meeting with Gwent Wildlife Trust, with um, Monmouthshire County Council officers and talk through those concerns and it should be full presented to planning committee for the final decision. So the proposal is to withdraw it from today's committee and to discuss that at the future meeting. Right. Thank you very much for that, Craig. So that will come before us sometime in the future, but as of yet, we don't know when. So, um, but it will be decided later on. Um, so that one, the, both of those applications are now withdrawn from today's planning committee. The next one on the agenda is application DM stroke 2020 stroke 01076. And this is at Lynn Gibby Esk. Uh, who is presenting that one? Is it you, Andrew? Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. And by way of introduction, my name is Andrew Jones, um, Development Management Area Manager. Uh, so this, this is a full application for the change of use of a Dutch barn to allow for the storage of private motor vehicles. And as you can see on screen, the site is located along Park Road on the edge of the village of Lingibi. Uh, now, this application was previously presented to Planning Committee at the April meeting uh, and was deferred by unanimous vote to enable officers to consider the physical works that have been carried out to the building uh, and accordingly, as such, uh, whether the application had been um, advertised correctly. Um, so further to this, officers have been in discussions with the applicant. Um, the works the applicant did discuss the works with with the planning department in January of 2017 uh, and it was advised that the provisions of part six of the general permitted development order would be applicable. Whilst 
no prior notification application at the time was received. Um, we have received photographic evidence, um, which I'll come on to now in the slides, that the finish, the works were finished by at least May 2017. Um, the applicants advised that they were done by March 2017, but we've only got photographic evidence up until May 2017. Um, but based on that passage of time, um, say whilst an application for prior notification wasn't received, the works are now in planning terms lawful. So I'll just quickly run through those slides. So that's the site layout there. It's a complex of buildings and barns. So you can see that was the building in its original form, and that is the building now in its current form at the top of the screen. And that was before any works were taken, undertaken. These are more recent photographs. We should then also have a, a slide showing it um, on the next screen. Show it completed by um, May 2017. So um, according, the officers are very grateful to Councillor Howard for raising what is a very important matter, um, but to confirm that the development description for the application that's now before you uh, does include all of the works that require consent. Um, and therefore, further to the presentation given uh, at the last meeting, the officer's recommendation therefore remains the same, um, that the application is uh, approved subject to the conditions set out in the report uh, that would include the building being used only for private use um, and provides a cap on the capacity of the amount of vehicles that could be stored in the building. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for that. Uh clarity in, in what must, might have confused some of the members of the committee. Thank you, Councillor Howard, for raising that at the last meeting. Um, I wish now to call anybody now who wish to comment. Could you please raise your hand in the chat bar? Councillor Murphy. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, as Andrew says, uh, this uh, building is, is, is now lawful. Um, I know that there was some um, disquiet about it locally, uh, but the fact remains that in planning terms, it, it, it is uh, lawful. Um, as the conditions uh, make it quite clear that this is for uh, the storage of private uh, vehicles and certainly not in uh, any form of, of trading. Um, I'm uh, of the opinion now that uh, we must uh, approve this uh, application. Um, so uh, please take that as my uh, recommendation for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank, right, thank you, Phil. Councillor Murphy. Uh, Councillor Roger Harris next, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, yes, I, I have to um, uh, agree with uh, Phil. You know, to outsiders, sometimes the decisions we make seem to be uh, a bit perverse, but we have to go on on what is planning regulations as opposed to um, uh, what we think may happen in the future or what's happened in the uh, in 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 the past and uh, you know from what i have in front of me i i can see uh, no reason why we could possibly uh, uh, turn this down but obviously uh, the local population has a concern here and uh, you know if they feel that uh, the conditions are being flouted then i just hope that they keep a record of of uh, any what they consider to be uh, misdemeanors and if there are any to make sure they get reported to the uh, planning committee because if conditions aren't complied with we have uh, redress further down the uh, the line thank you madam chair thank you councillor harris it was remiss of me. I believe it's in Councillor Clark's ward, so I could have asked him first of all if he wanted to comment. Do you now, at the end of those two discussions, Councillor Clark, wish to comment? Councillor Clark? Anybody else wish to comment then until I can get Councillor Clark? No one else wish to comment? Yes, perhaps I could. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, yeah Councillor Jordan. 
Yeah, um, I'd say um, the 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 construction now looks far better than it did in um, 2014. <laughs> yes, um, but I, I don't quite. If if we're precluding the use of the premises for commercial purposes, what is the reason for imposing a restriction of 13 vehicles only? Because you might be able to have, for example, 10 large cars or 15 <laughs> small cars. I mean, what's what? Could, could the planning officer explain to me the restriction of 13? Thank you. Right. Other, other, otherwise, I'd uh, recommend approval. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Andrew, do you wish to come back on Councillor Jordan's query, please? Andrew, you're muted at the moment, if you can hear. Apologies, Chair. No, right. I was ju just uh, trying to get my microphone back connected. Um, I've just double checked the officer's report. I mean, the, the building itself will obviously have, have a natural capacity of, of what it um, can store. Um, so I appreciate it, it may feel uh, like an arbitrary number. I mean, obviously it's, it's within members' gift if they feel that number is excessive or if they wish to consider a different condition. Um, but I think that was felt was what would be the capacity that building could accommodate. Um, and I know there was some some discussions at the previous meeting about concern about additional sort of vehicles being s stored outside. So I'll say officers are satisfied with that number that that building um, could take that number um, as a reasonable number being stored as a collection. Um, but as I said, it, it, it's for members to discuss whether they feel a different number would be more appropriate as a condition to the consent. Should we say containing owners cars specifically? and not to overflow in the outside area? Andrew? Uh, ap ap apologies, Chair, no, I'm having difficulties with the microphone. It's all right, the wind yeah. is blowing like anything here, so perhaps that's the problem. Um, I mean, the condition is not worded at the moment um, to restrict outdoor use, um, usage. Obviously, it's uh, at member's discretion if they felt there was a landscape um, visual impact of additional vehicles being stored outside. Um, but the condition only, only relates to how the building is it's used. The building being used and stored inside. So that doesn't sort of preclude as as, the, as worded, um, it wouldn't wouldn't cover the land around it. And really so what's before us is the use of the building itself. And that's why the condition only relates to the building and what's stored within it, because that's really all that's before us. So um, mm -hmm. the officers are satisfied with that number uh, for that building at that capacity. Um, and it is proposed, the officer's view is that it, that would be our advice that is an acceptable um, means to restrict that. Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Brown. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Chair, I would support the idea of um, restricting use outside because um, of the reason that it makes it um, more clear that it's not commercial. Because obviously, if you have um, vehicles outside on on display, then um, you know it gives the impression of uh, a more commercial use. So I would support having an extra condition of. Um, making sure that it was for internal storage only, if that's possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I would just thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, I would say that the the application site um, is is clearly edged in red, which sort of covers the building. And that's that is really what's what's before us. Um, it would be very difficult to uh, obviously we can only condition and, and control through the planning application what is within the yeah, red line please. boundary. Um, yeah. I, I think it would be quite difficult to, to uh, say, well, we shouldn't be imposing t conditions on elements outside of the, the application boundary. Uh, yeah, I can understand. And, and also for, from an enforcement perspective, um, it, it would be, even if it was extended, it would be quite difficult to, to monitor that. So I think the, the building is what's before us, the use of the building is what's yes. before us. Yeah. Uh, we feel that that condition is reasonable and pr proportionate to that building and that, and that yeah. use that's before us. Um, so yeah. we would suggest that the conditions are followed uh, as set out in the report. Right, thank you very much for that explanation, Andrew. And we do know, as you say, what is in front of us today, and it is specifically just the shed. Anybody else wish to comment? 
No. Councillor Clark, do you wish to comment now at the end? And otherwise I shall go to the vote. No, no. <coughs> go to the Right. Thank you. Councillor Phil Murphy has moved approval uh, and seconded by Councillor Harris. So could I have your vote in the chat bar now, please? My chat bar hasn't come up, Madam Chairman, but I, I go along with the members. You are voting for approval of the application then, Councillor Higginson? Yeah, yeah that, that, the one that is, yeah. Right, thank you, Councillor Higginson. That will be counted as your um, vote for approval. Um, good afternoon again, Chair. So including Councillor Higgle, uh, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Higginson. Councillor Higginson. Councillor, sorry, I've had a bit of a, a blank there. Councillor Higginson's vote, that's 12 for approval. We've had no abstentions and um, none against approval. So that's quite clearly passed. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Denzel. Now we go to application DM stroke 2020 stroke 01766. And this is at the Kim in Monmouth. That's you again, Andrew. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'll just wait for the um, slides to come up for members. No. No. So I'll wait for those to. So yeah, this is an application uh, for the retention of extensions and alterations to a property known as Bewley Barn. Uh, as you said, Chair, this is located at the Kimmin, just outside of Monmouth. Um, the application site is located within the Y Valley AONB and is also situated in close proximity to the Office Dyke footpath, which you can actually see on the site location plan there marked um, in front of you. Um, so that's the Ordnance Survey Plan. I think the next slide you can see um, an aerial view there showing the areas of woodland that surround the site. So in terms of the application, as noted, the proposal seeks permission for the retention of extension or alterations to the dwelling. Uh, the works as erected and for which permission is now sought include a second gable to the rear, which is the north elevation, a lean-to element linking to another rear two-storey gable, uh, whilst the rear elevation is now uh, clad with timber. And just for the sake of clarity, the overall height of the building now measures at 6.6 .6 metres. I'm just turning back to the slides on the presentation for you now, members. So this is a view of the building uh, as built in situ, that's the front elevation. And on the next slide, that is a view um, taken from the rear of the building. Uh, here, this is a view that's take, taken actually stood on the uh, Office Dyke footpath. Uh, and this is a view taken from the lane uh, just to the sort of south of the, the building. And here are two sort of wider views. The one at the bottom there uh, shows how the sort of land slopes down to the application site. Um, so as noted in the officer's report, there is a lengthy planning history associated with the site. Uh, and so for members clarity, uh, I'll just briefly run through this further um, via the slides on screen for you now. So the, the screen before you now shows the building is converted and as was existing uh, for application DC 2016-00287, which sought consent for a two storey extension. So that was the building at that point in time. The next slide then um, shows the approved elevations for that two storey extension that was granted by, by pardon, planning committee. Um, the next slide then shows a previous approval from 2020, uh, but this was not built in accordance to the approved plans and is now what results in the application which is now before us. So the next slide shows us the elevations as in situ, as you've seen from the photographs previously. And then we also have 
the ground floor plan and the first floor plan also. So in terms of principal and material considerations, the, the building itself uh, was originally converted to a dwelling under policy H7 of the former unitary development plan, um, but the equivalent policy now, which is H4, is clear that the criteria detailed within it will also be applied to proposals to extend buildings that have already been converted. So looking at the building itself, um, as I noted previously, a sizable two storey side extension to the building was approved by planning committee in January 2017 under the application 2016 uh, And this represented approximately an 84 percent increase in floor space. And the permission also included a full glazed side, and that's the west gable end, uh, as well as a full height glazed single storey projection to the rear. It's also relevant to note that in August 2018, the applicant successfully appealed against the conditions imposed on the original conversion of the building, as a reference from 2007, that saw part one permitted development rights afforded back to the property. Uh, it's worth noting in allowing that appeal, the inspector stated in respect to the extension that was approved in 2017, and it's still extant, that the permitted extension requests a material change to the site circumstances. At the time, whilst it has not yet been constructed, I afford substantial weight to it as a fallback position. Therefore, the planning history of the building, in particular the extant consent granted in 2017 by committee for a two-storey extension and the inspector's decision to restore permitted about rights must be afforded appropriate weight when considering the works now before us and for what consent is now sought. Uh, and whilst the height of the original building is now 850 millimetres higher, officers do not consider that this particular change results in the building itself becoming unacceptably more visually prominent or intrusive within the wider AONB. The changes to the rear elevation perhaps differ most from the previous approval, approvals, uh, and this elevation is now finished almost entirely with timber cladding. Um, However, officers have carefully considered the additional visual impact in terms of scale and mass of the provisions of an additional two storey gable and that the timber cladding uh, included in the previous consent and officers review that such a finish in terms of timber is traditional, uh, does read as a secondary material that will also weather in time that distinguishes the works from the original stone elements. With regards to the extensive glazing, uh, it is noted that the extant consent granted in 2017 also included a fully glazed side gable. And therefore officers are not of the view that what has been built would cause such unacceptable additional harm to the character of the building and therefore would not warrant refusal. Having regard to the wider area of outstanding natural beauty uh, and that wider context, as stated in a number of the third party objections and also comments received from the AOMB officer um, that there are concerns relating to the scale of the building and that it would be create a persistent and dominant feature in the landscape uh, as well as concerns with regards to potential light pollution. And whilst I've already addressed the physical works and the scale of the building, when considering the potential light spill from the building, yeah. the main area of glazing is located in the western side gable. However, wider views of the western boundary of the site is characterised by mature woodland uh, known as Garth Wood. And as such, it's not considered that the spillage of light now proposed would result in the building becoming overly prominent within the wider AOMB so as to fail to conserve and enhance the natural beauty of the area. And as noted previously, a full length gable does form part of the extant consent. Notwithstanding this, though, it's recommended that permitted development rights in respect of external lighting are to be removed, which would prevent any additional lighting being placed outside of the building. Um, this would also have ecological benefits. Whilst the existing garden area is enclosed by mature vegetation, particularly to the eastern boundary, it's acknowledged that there are some gaps within this and that by filling in these gaps, as well as some additional supplementary soft landscaping, this would further help the building to assimilate into the rural landscape. Officers are of the view that whilst views of Bewley Barn from Office Dyke have always existed and that appropriate additional soft landscaping will further soften views of the building from this well-used footpath. 
having regard to all of the issues when considering the visual impact of the extended building itself and by association its wider contribution to the AOMB, officers are satisfied that any additional demonstrable harm caused by the works now under consideration is not such that it would warrant a recommendation of refusal. With regards to residential amenity and impact on third parties, uh, as set out in the officer's report, Fuley Barn is located approximately 80 metres uh, and 75 metres respectively to the nearest neighbouring dwellings. Uh, the officer's report also details the positions of all new window openings uh, and owing to these positions, as well as the significant distances to neighbouring properties, it's not concluded that development would give rise to an unacceptable loss of third party privacy. And similarly, noting that the original building ridge height uh, has now been increased by 850 millimetres, having regard to the distances I've stated, uh, as well as intervening, intervening vegetation, it's not concluded that the building would give rise to a harmful overbearing impact on any third party residential amenity. In conclusion, uh, the application has been very carefully considered by officers. Accordingly, it's presented to you today with a recommendation for approval. However, I would propose if members are minded to endorse the recommendation to approve that the details required by conditions two and four are provided prior to approval and, and agreed by the delegated panel and that then these conditions become compliance conditions only. So subject to those small changes, those details being provided up front, uh, the application is presented chair with a recommendation for approval. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Uh, I do believe that the local member for this area is not a member of the planning committee and has as yet not commented on it. But maybe I should have consulted with uh, Craig a bit more on that. But he has got two audio presentations to make before the committee, before the members with us today can comment. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, these are two, um, one audio take from uh, a local resident and one um, video response um, on a re for representative of the applicant. So the first one I will play for you. So please bear with me while I share my screen. Oh, into technology. Apologies, Madam Chair, we just have a little technicality. Can members now see a music note on this? Yes, yes, we're all singing now. Okay, now this is a um, audio tape from um, Mr Hatton, a local resident. My name is Robert Hatton and I'm making this statement as an objector in respect of planning application reference DM 20200-01766, which refers to number 25, the Kimmon. My home, 22, the Kimmon, borders this new development and I have a clear elevated view from the south of the same. Like a number of neighbours, I supported the original planning application in 2016, which was to extend the existing small stone dwelling to give a modern standard of residential accommodation. This extension would allow for two bedrooms and a small single storey pitched roof extension to the rear of the property. A further planning application, DM 20200669, for minor amendments to the original application, was approved by the planning officer in July 2020. The planning officer's report, amongst other things, indicated an increase in the ridge height of the single storey extension to the rear to match the main building ridge height. No mention of an increase in overall main building ridge height was made in the narrative or the addition of a skylight to the front of the building. It must be said that the submitted plans were not clear and it was difficult to read the various measurements given on the same. So it was not possible to accurately gauge the true extent of these minor alterations. I understand that the current retrospective planning application has been issued to reflect the dimensions and features of the completed building, which are clearly in breach of the two previous planning consents given. 
Like myself, the majority of the 30 plus local objectors feel that the building scale is wrong for the position that it occupies and its appearance is at odds with the existing dwellings in its near vicinity. Typically, the immediate neighbouring cottages are of white painted brick or stone construction and have an appropriate amount of glazing. This building is clearly visible from a number of neighbouring homes and more importantly, the various footpaths that cross the property. It simply does not fit well into the landscape or existing architectural styles. Because of the increased roof height of nearly a metre, then the building dominates the landscape and as such degrades the visual amenity that was previously enjoyed by near neighbours, visitors and walkers alike. The amount of glazing is excessive and does not blend in sympathetically with the existing landscape. Indeed, it is fair to say that there isn't a similar building like it on the Kimmon. In respect of the additional two-storey gable extension, then this merely reinforces the feeling of a gratuitous and unnecessary addition and does nothing to add to the charm of the building. This particular part of the Kimmon with the Offers Dyke National Trail arguably gives visitors their first impressions of the Kimmon. It is therefore important that any new development blends in well with the existing dwellings in the immediate vicinity. It must be borne in mind that the Kimmon is in an AONB and it is notable that both the Wye Valley AONB office and Monmouth Town Council are both objected to this planning application. For the reasons given, then I urge the committee to refuse this planning application. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And now we have the second audio. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I'll just move the technology over. Can you please let me know when you've got an image of a gentleman? Yes. On? Yes, Craig, yes. have a gentleman on the screen. OK, then I will play this, which is uh, Mr Edge making representations for the applicant, Mr Tuttle. Thank you. Hi, my name is David Edge and I'm a neighbour of James Tuttle. I live about 100 metres away and his house is um, visible from mine. Um, I've lived on the Kim Inn for over 30 years and I have no business or financial relationship with James Tuttle or any of his associates. And the purpose of saying that is just to emphasise I'm speaking purely as a neighbour. The house that Mr Tuttle has is a three bed detached property. All the houses on the Kim Inn vary in size from two to five or six bedrooms. So in my opinion, um, a three bed, a large three bed house is quite in keeping with the typical size of property on the Kim Inn. Mr Tuttle's house is, is made from uh, natural Kimmin stone. Um, there's an oak frame. There's, I think, larch planking and natural slate roof. It's probably as in keeping as a rural property or more in keeping as a rural property than most of the properties on the Kimmin. Again, my opinion, but that's what I think. It's also on the edge of the settlement. There's some 45 to 50 houses on the Kimmin and Mr Tuttle's house is on the north periphery. It's not particularly prominent, it's surrounded by hedges and whilst it's overlooked by two or three properties, they are a little bit distant. My understanding is that uh, one of the issues is that uh, there's a second gable on the rear of the property. My understanding is that the um, work was undertaken by Mr Tuttle as under the permitted development uh, legislation based on uh, reading the technical guidance from the Welsh office or the Welsh government which is I think 60 to 70 page document and this was confirmed by MCC planners. Sadly the technical guidance from the Welsh government was wrong but by the time this was identified as I understand it Mr Tuttle had already ordered his oak frame and it had been manufactured. Hence, at that time, it would be difficult to change the structure. And I think the planners can probably confirm that. In my opinion, quite genuinely, the property is an attractive building. It's in a six acre site. Um, 
I, I feel it's in keeping with the locality. I do think that some of the objections to the development are driven more than, but more by personal animosity to Mr. Tuttle than by um, a genuine appreciation of the aesthetics of the property. And I'm not entirely sure that that uh, a like or dislike from Mr. Tuttle is relevant in a, a planning process. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's the end of the public speaking on this application. Right, we've had both sides of the coin there. So, uh, as I said, the local member is not a member of the planning committee, so I will welcome comments from anybody on the committee. Councillor Murphy, you're the first one, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And um, we've looked quite objectively at, at this. I think that um, it's a considerable improvement on the planning uh, permission that was originally given. I don't quite understand the um, the uh, previous uh, speaker talking about the glass because uh, again, my understanding is is that that, that was approved on the on the um, original um, approval. Um, so I don't really see that that uh, becomes an issue. Um, had this have come before us in its present state, uh, when we looked at it before, I'm quite certain that um, we would have uh, approved it. As I say, it is, a, in my opinion anyway, a considerable improvement on, uh, on, on what was there. Uh, but I have got one uh, question. Um, uh, we were told uh, by Andrew just now that um, that part of the conditions was removing the, um, the permitted development rights. Um, but there was also reference to the fact that that they they were they were given by the inspector when when it was locked up before. I'd be just grateful if Andrew could just clear up that uh, that that point, as I think there may be some confusion there. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Murphy. Yeah, the 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 part I referred to that we're now proposing this condition uh, relates to lighting, which falls under a separate part of the general permitted development order. Um, the previous inspector's decision um, overturned a, a previous condition that removed part one, so that would cover extensions and alterations and other minor improvements that you can do to a property um, under permitted development. So because this is a householder application, uh, it's not really before us now to, to remove part one again via a separate condition for part one, the lighting comes under a separate part. Um, but what I would say is that Closely because the manner in which the building has been extended already, as well as being within uh, the AONB, that the amount it could be extended further under those part one permitted development rights is very limited. Um, I think the officer's view would be that um, in terms of the permitted development rights are factored off from the original building. Um, and so whilst the applicant does have those part one rights, um, the ability to extend further without coming back to the council for another application permission would be quite limited. So. Um, I hope that just to, to be clear, the, the rights we're referring to at the moment is for lighting um, and we're not proposing it's reasonable or that in our, in our gift to remove part one extensions and alterations permitted development rights. OK, thank you, Andrew. In that case, Chair, can I move approval? Thank you, Councillor Murphy. I'll see if there's any more comments first, otherwise I'll take your uh, proposal. Uh, anyone else now wish to comment? I should have consulted Councillor Webb earlier about this application because I believe she chairs the AONB. So I'd welcome any comment, if possible, from Councillor Webb. Has it I been don't have any comments, actually, Madam Chairman. I've listened to all the debate and um, um, even though I am um, chair of the AONB, I didn't take any part in the in the response from the AONB. But I don't know if that makes it uh, an interest, but um, I wouldn't yeah. imagine so. Thank you very right. much. Right, thank you. Our second, our second uh, Councillor Phil Murphy's um, proposal, if that's OK, because yeah. I can't see any reason as far as the planning um, uh, proposal is um, to, to object to this. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Councillor Alan Davis, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I agree totally with uh, the approval of this application, but uh, Andrew did mention in his uh, talk there about extra work on landscaping. So I'm yes. just wondering, is that part of the conditions that we are imposing? Uh, because obviously it's considered to be needed. So I just want some clarification there. Thank you. Right. 
Thank you, Andrew. Could you uh, please clarify there for Councillor Davis? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Davis. Um, yeah, just for clarity, the, the report as written have required two elements to be submitted by two separate conditions. One relating to biodiversity enhancements and the second um, in respect of soft la additional soft landscaping. Um, what I was proposing in the presentation to amend those two is that those details, so additional soft landscaping, um, so, so some some of the hedgerows I suggested um, might need um, some reinforcements as well as potentially some additional planting along the sort of bottom of the garden area and obviously the biodiversity enhancements, whatever they might be, blackbird boxes, pollinator planting, etc. But the reason for my change in the presentation was that those details be provided now rather than being required to be submitted through a discharge and condition application. Those details are submitted now on one drawing showing those all of those elements that we could say, agree through the delegated panel and that those conditions then as granted would simply be compliance conditions so that the landscaping details are implemented, the biodiversity en enhancements are implemented and that is all that the condition seeks rather than the applicant coming back in again for further details. Um, I think or in, in the nature of the retrospective nature of it that that, that is a, a, a better and cleaner process and, and if members were minded to uh, approve then uh, it would be on the basis those conditions are amended accordingly. Thank you for that explanation, Andrew. I'm sure all members will agree to that anyway. So, um, Councillor Murphy, I believe you've moved approval and Councillor Webb seconded your proposal. So could I have a show of hands uh, in the chat bar, please, as to your decision? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon again, Madam Chair. We've now had um, 11, uh, 12 responses, um, 11 for, uh, for approval, uh, one is to abstain, so that's clearly been approved. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much indeed, Denzel. That concludes our applications for the afternoon, but we do have uh, information on the inspectorate uh, appeals decisions. Uh, I believe maybe, Phil, are you going to present the appeals or is it Amy? Amy, thank you. Yeah. Is me, thank you. That's quite all right. Yeah, Phil, just get you, you sir, just wait a second for the presentation to pop up. It'll be a bit more clearer then. Fabulous, thank you. So the first appeal decision is at Lingfields in uh, Five Lanes in Kerwent. This is an appeal against the refusal of planning permission for extensions in a detached garage. So the application involved a first floor extension to the front and the back of the property um, and a detached garage, as we can see on the next slide as a site plan. The garage um, was considered acceptable um, in all terms and the, um, the issues related more to the extensions uh, on the property, as you can see there. So the next slide shows the south elevation, the existing and proposed situation proposed at the top there with the extensions um, to the north and the south of the property, sorry, east and west of the property, extending on both sides. And the next slide will show you the north elevation again projecting on both sides. And we have the front elevation of the property with a two storey uh, extension situated next to the porch. And the rear again as a first floor extension over an existing single storey extension. And the photographs on the next slide will show us the uh, front elevation and kind of slightly offset of the side elevation and rear of the uh, uh, cottage. So officers considered that the extensions were out of character with the traditional cottage. However, the inspector concluded they were relatively modest as the cottage had been modified um, over time and they were not incongruous with the building or the wider, clay, wider landscape, so they did not cause sufficient visual harm to warrant refusal. Officers also suggested that the extension was too close to the adjacent neighbour, i.e. the woodlands, and would have an overly dominant impact on the neighbour. However, the inspector considered that 18 metres separation and the obscure glazing mitigated any harm and therefore was indeed acceptable. So in terms of the lessons here, in terms of the, the character of the cottage was 
what the officers were trying to preserve and considered that a two-storey extension to the front elevation was was incongruous. However, uh, with design, there's always an element of subjectivity and the inspector then concluded that it wasn't harmful in the wider landscape or to the traditional character of the cottage and deemed them acceptable. So the next appeal that we have is St. Tylo's uh, Lantilio Pasoli. So this application was originally for 14 dwellings in the open countryside, which through the negotiation was reduced to 11 units. The application was refused on the basis that the site is outside the development boundary and is considered to be in the open countryside, contrary to policy LC1. So if we have a look at the site plan there, so the development would have an unacceptable impact on the landscape due to the density and arrangement and changes in level and the damages to um, ecological habitats with an adverse impact on the setting of the uh, Great One listed building. You can see the house, the site plan there shows the proposed development with the main terrace of houses following the line of the road to the north and south and a small group to the top uh, eastern corner connected by the access bridge over the brook. So the next slides will show you the street scene and the contemporary approach to the dwellings. Uh, the roofs are there visible, the tops are, and you can see the roofs are visible from the, from the main road. So the inspector dismissed the appeal and agreed with the council's argument. He stated that they provide, he did provide some material weight to the contribution of how affordable housing stock. Um, however, this would not outweigh the harm caused to the wider landscape and the setting of historic assets and the environmental impact to which the officer supported the inspector's office inspector supported all officers' concerns. So the appeal was also accompanied by an application for costs. Um, based on the time taken to determine the application and that additional information was submitted by officers of the council at a late stage. However, the inspector did not agree that the majority of the delay caused any significant harm or unnecessary costs to the applicant. In fact, acknowledged that this was an attempt to try and negotiate um, a normal procedure of applications. However, in relation to later information supplied by the landscape officer of the council, it was identified as causing an element of delay to the applicant and a small award of costs has been granted, which will be considered between the applicant and officers. There is some discrepancy to whether when this information was submitted. However, we do feel that the uh, inspector's decision will is only related to those two rebuttals and will only be a small element of costs in relation to, to our conduct. Well, thank you for that explanation uh, on our appeals, because generally we do pretty well on our appeals. Thank you very much, Amy. Well, that concludes the meeting on all the agenda of today. But just to remind members that we have got an LDP uh, seminar at five o'clock. All of those who could manage and is topically um, the main issue is going to be transport. So hope to see some of you on screen then at five o'clock. Thank you all very much indeed for your attendance. I now close the meeting and I am in County Hall, so I shall go home then to tune in again at five o'clock. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.